I want to make it very clear off the top that this is not the end of turning things into SCPs on this channel, but that every episode in that series going forward will canonically be set before today's episode. Also, the story in this episode is being told by our SCP's narrator himself, Professor Dresden Oakland, to another character that's getting drawn today, and this conversation took place 20 years prior to all of the Multiverse Tales episodes currently coming out. Now with that all said, let's get into a very lore-heavy episode, Dresden Oakland and the Death of the SCP Foundation. Let's go! Hit like if you want, and subscribe if you so wish, but either way, enjoy the show. Most who know me would not likely describe me as a man of abundant hope, though that is partially because of the character I have convinced most that I am. I have indeed had a complicated relationship with the feeling in my time, but I do indeed have hope, as I believe the multiverse will become a thriving place for all, once the overseers are handled. And this is something that may be finally accomplishable with your aid, if what you say is true. Thus far in my life there have been none I've willingly shared my full self with, but if we are to work together, I believe you must know how I came to the perspective that I have now. You see, prior to becoming the overseer of my universe, I was once under the employ of a foundation that helped protect my world by containing and keeping secret the dangerous and supernatural entities that threatened to ravage it. I spent two decades of my life, which back then seemed like a long period of time, working tirelessly to build up the SCP Foundation, to teach its employees how to better protect our world, to show them that while our actions could sometimes seem quite vile and admittedly downright cruel at times, they were always for the long-term betterment of the people we were charged with protecting. And all the while, I wholeheartedly believed that those who employed me had the same goal. Into my 20th year at the Foundation, I started growing suspicious of some of the decisions made by the O5 Council. These were our trusted leaders, also referred to as the Overseers, a term that means much more to me now in the grander scheme of the multiverse. Well, I'd never met them in person, I'd been one of the few people allowed to speak to them through a direct line, and believed that every order sent my way was intended to help further keep peace and order. But eventually, each order that came in seemed to be inching us closer and closer to a proverbial cliff. I thought they may just be getting sloppy, giving them the benefit of the doubt when they began greenlighting dangerous experiments and containment practices that seemed doomed to fail. I tried questioning them only a handful of times and at every turn was condemned for doing so. More and more containment breaches of the entities we housed were occurring weekly. On top of that, more and more entities were appearing every day, ones that seemed determined to make our lives more difficult. The world was becoming overrun with creatures it couldn't understand or even remotely handle. It seemed like it was a fast acceleration to everything going wrong, but in retrospect I see that I'd been the frog boiling in the pot. Things had been slowly getting worse and worse for years, and it was all finally coming to a head, and becoming clear that something had always been gravely wrong with our Foundation. Our covers were suddenly being blown in every direction. The Foundation started being publicly spoken about on news stations across the world, many blaming us for everything that was going wrong. Some started praising our enemies, the Global Occult Coalition, as saviors that would protect the world from the failures of the Foundation. But this was a trivial concern in the grand scheme, as the Coalition would end up being wiped out within a manner of months. We did believe we had some allies in entities we'd studied that had proven to be truly benevolent. Unfortunately, all the most powerful of them were slain by other entities fairly quickly, as everything began to more rapidly escalate. I went a week without sleep, 
trying to get any allies I could muster to help, trying to take weaponry and fight escapees myself, consoling employees who were watching their friends be slaughtered. My life had become more grim than any nightmare I'd experienced. There seemed absolutely nothing I or any of the other determined, exhausted Foundation personnel could do to stop it. And at this point, we'd all but stopped hearing from our precious overseers. With none of my co-workers knowing where to turn or what to do, I took the only action I believed I could. I dug through all the most restricted, classified files to find any way to locate the O5 Council and demand a course of action in person, or at least an explanation of how they'd let all of this come to be. Eventually, I discovered a report, decades older than myself, which implied a meeting place deep underground beneath one of our facilities entitled the Ruby Sector Biome. I marched down through its depths, feeling as though I were descending to have a council with the devil himself. But it was not only he that I found there. In an elegantly designed cavern full of every pleasurable amenity I could imagine, I did indeed find a council of five. And a bizarre one, at that. Four of the five beings all resembled religious or mythical entities from various cultures. Lucifer, Zeus, Ra, and Shiva. The fifth woman resembled no deity, though she did have a set of glowing runes cascading across her arms and shoulders. As I found them, all were clinking glasses and laughing as they watched hundreds of hovering images around them showing our world being ravaged. I can still hear their laughs. Like a piercing needle stabbing into the back of my neck, I can feel the overwhelming apathy they had for the people that they'd convinced me for so long were those we were meant to protect. At first, I tried to rationalize that there was something else at play there. Something that they knew that I didn't that could somehow make this for the betterment of our world. But that was when they became aware of my presence. The woman with the runes clapped sarcastically, stating false praise at my finding them. She approached and in an infuriatingly jovial tone told me that she was Tarsa, the one true overseer of our world, a world she'd allegedly protected for hundreds of years. She'd once eagerly chosen to fill it with monstrous creatures, but then, on a whim, also created a foundation to protect the world from them. All essentially a ruse, a simple excuse to have a sick reality show, where she could make more and more ruthless beasts just to see how we at the foundation would respond. Our lives, the lives of myself and everyone in my world, were no more than just a game to her. Her council were just bored beings who'd once been overseers themselves, and came looking for a show. They'd advise Tarsa on new creatures and catastrophes to concoct, something they could do with great efficiency thanks to a device they'd acquired that I now know to be the Multiversal Orb. It is an object of great power that I would not even trust in the hands of a benevolent savior. In the hands of a fiend like Tarsa. I have learned in my time that revenge is a useless outcome to seek, no matter the indecency done to you. But I cannot lie and pretend that I would not get great satisfaction from watching her and her whole lot burn in a pit of unending flames. Anyhow, eventually Tarsa and her council had grown bored of their little game and decided to slowly chip away at the Foundation's good work to eventually have all our most dangerous entities freed to bring about the final end to our world, so she could then move on to find another to start over with. I was in such complete shock that all I could muster to ask was, how? Can you care so little for the pain you were causing? And again, she laughed. She said in the grand scheme, the pain these people were feeling was fleeting. 
but I saw the images around us. I heard the cries of terror, the confused anguish of children whose parents were devoured by beasts before them, people who dedicated their lives to protecting the innocent, being slain by monsters they'd done all they could to contain, only to have those they followed loose them back onto the world. Even if I'd been more level-headed in that moment, I doubt I could have said anything to sway that foul wretch to change what she was doing. But it's irrelevant, as I certainly was not able to stay level-headed. As is likely understandable, I allowed my rage to overtake me. I struck her across the jaw with my fist and tried to swing again, but she stepped back, tapping the runes on her forearm as she did. The last thing I heard was her telling me to give my regards to the Reaper. Not that I understood her correctly in saying that at the time. A plume of magma then erupted from the floor beneath me. Before that day, I'd many times prior held my palm over a fire to see how much pain I could handle before pulling away. It becomes unbearable quite quickly. But pulling away from the searing blaze that Tarsa erupted over me was unfortunately not an option. The stench of burning meat as my own nostrils were cooked inside my head still slips through my mind from time to time. I certainly believed that that was my end, but to my own surprise, I awoke, I'm not sure how much later, likely a few days. I was in the same place, my body was well, essentially in the state you see now. Tarsa and the others were gone, and all that remained of them was my still burning world, and the glowing runes that had once been found on Tarsa. They were now on me. I never saw her again, though I have since learned her location. She is now the Overseer of Dimension Alpha 016, and has been more subtle with her torment of that world though I have also learned that she is raising a daughter to take her place as the Overseer, so hopefully that is the last world she intends to haunt. Anyhow, I had no one to teach me what these runes were or how to use them. I knew they held some power considering what I'd seen from Tarsa, but trying to learn to use them with no coaching was like trying to learn an instrument while trapped in a cave alone. Not technically impossible, but certainly far from easy, and I did not have time to acquire the skills I needed. I spent the next year learning as fast as I could, and doing everything in my power to reorganize the Foundation and bring any kind of balance I could to the most ravaged parts of my world. Having become the overseer of my world, I needed almost no sleep, thankfully, and eventually learned I could control weather patterns to a certain degree so I could bring rains to burning cities, and earthquakes to level places beyond saving, but still overrun with entities. But for every one person I saved, ten were still dying. I'd gained my abilities too late. Every single day the flames of my hope died a little bit more, but I couldn't allow myself to give up. I created safe houses in the few isolated regions of my world that were untouched by the chaos. I put people in bunkers. I brought them food and supplies. If one safe house was attacked, I'd get the people out as fast as possible and move them to another. I was not going to give up on my world, no matter what horrors came my way. That is, until I was no longer given an option. Some of the more powerful entities of my world, the most cruel and vile, learned how to leave my world, to go out across the vast multiverse and torment other worlds. And that is when I learned what Tarsa's final words to me had meant. That was when I met the Reaper. The Reaper was far from what I'd expected in terms of appearance and task. She was not simply some being in a black cloak who came to dying individuals to lead them to the afterlife. She is one who comes to universes that threaten the rest of the multiverse and cleanses them. 
She is the sole being in the multiverse with the ability to kill every single life form in a universe with a single slash of her scepter. Often, she will not give an overseer who has attracted her attention a choice. If they've been so incompetent at their job as to allow their universe to threaten all others, then she will simply strike her blade through the energy inside an overseer that connects them to their world, killing both them and eviscerating every living being in their universe. But she took some slight pity on me. I told her I had not caused this horror, that I wanted to save my world but did not know how, that the overseer who granted me the position had caused the catastrophes before us, and if given time I could salvage my world and some of the innocent lives on it. She understood my position, but could not allow my world's residents to threaten the multiverse, and claimed that she'd seen many worlds on the brink of demise, and that mine was far over the ledge. I have only once begged for anything in my 6,000 years, and it was in that moment. I'd spent my entire life trying to protect that world, and all I wanted was to keep the few innocents still remaining safe from demise. I pleaded for her to give me more time, to prove I could do it. Her expression was soft and kind and I thought she'd show some humanity. But in a chillingly polite voice, she said, No. She did leave me with something, however. Something that she was supposed to take. My life. She reached her hand into my chest and pulled out a glimmering ball of energy tied directly in tandem with others that stretched forth from my chest. My vision split into a thousand directions, and I could hear a symphony of screams across my world. Instead of her driving her scepter through this energy as she was supposed to, she carefully scratched it, leaving a pink gash in it, and in alignment, a slash across my own eye. A mark that will forever remind me of how gravely I failed my world. As she did this, all of the screams ceased. I'd been so distracted with my duty that I hadn't noticed the immense physical pain that I'd been under. The only reason I recognized it then was because it finally stopped. I could feel through my whole essence that there were truly no living beings left in my entire universe, save for myself and the Reaper, but she too was soon gone. I was left in silence that almost felt deafening. Everything and everyone that I tried, truly tried so hard to save, was gone. I believe there is no more catastrophic failure that has ever occurred, though I eventually accepted what should have been obvious then. I was not to blame. I'm not sure how long I wallowed in an empty, lifeless universe. I sat in the ashes of a planet that could no longer sustain any life and just let the days and weeks slip by. Though I am not a being who can last long without a goal. While everything I'd known and cared for was gone, I did still have something. My life and my universe. It may have been a barren one, but there had to be something I could do. Some way to bring back life to these worlds and hopefully create a thriving society of people who would never know the horrors my previous world had gone through because I would watch over them. Someone who truly wanted their best and did not see them as just pawns in a sick game for my own pleasure. But I knew there was much I needed to learn to achieve this. I knew little about the multiverse, but did know that it existed, and if my world had an overseer, surely others did too. I decided to set off and study the most successful, benevolent overseers to see how they made life the best it could possibly be for their people. I started regaining flickers of my hope, though once more they would be doused by the frigid waters of the heartless work of other overseers. I traveled across hundreds of dimensions, sometimes spending as long as a decade studying a single world and the workings of its overseer, only to find that 
there were truly no good overseers. The ones who truly cared for their people were often incompetent and would end up harming others by trying to protect some. And the most powerful ones often used their abilities to similar aims as Tarsa. A more common trait I found was that many overseers would care deeply for a small, select few group of people, and ensure that they lived out interesting lives while neglecting the rest of the world, or even causing catastrophes simply to create further intrigue in the lives of the few that they cared for. It was sickening to watch. But it did eventually change my goal. One of the most heartbreaking, but eventually inspiring things to me was the fact that the few worlds I came to that had no overseer at all were the ones that seemed to be doing the best. There were still natural disasters and wars and tribulations, but at least no higher being forcing these things to go on. After my first 500 years or so, I'd learned all I needed to about how the multiverse worked, and much about my own abilities, though there was still far more room for improvement in that regard. But most importantly of all, I had learned that overseers were an outdated model of protector, though I hadn't yet met one of the most foul of them. After years of having my heart broken by the apathy of most overseers, I met one who was truly vile, but also very useful in my life path. I imagine you may have come across her before, as she is still alive to this day. She is an overseer who had burned her world to the ground and created a massive array of combat arenas for other seers to bring their champions to and watch them fight for their lives in various challenges against their will. She has gone by various names and appearances and genders, but is now often referred to as Eloise Ludum, the Games Master. She is the pinnacle of all I despise in Overseers, but upon meeting her we did strike a brief conversation, and after hearing that my universe was a lifeless wreck, she asked me for a favor. There was an incredibly powerful being who she'd taken into her arena, who'd won and was understandably still bitter with Ludum. He'd also acquired the ability to leap between universes and she needed a way to contain him. She told me if I were willing to trap him in my realm, bring him in, then lock my universe so nobody could transport themselves in or out, she'd make an overseer's bond with me. I imagine you are aware of these as they are essentially a type of curse. If two overseers forge a deal in this way and one does not live up to their end, a permanent, unhealable scar is burned into their flesh often across their face or head. The pain will subside in a few days, but it will be a permanent mark to show that this overseer is a traitor. On top of that, many overseers are particularly vain and would not want a mark such as this left on them. I asked Ludum what she was willing to do as her end of this bond, and she frivolously said she'd simply owe me an equivalent favor, one I could call in whenever I desired. She explained to me that, somehow, the underlying energy of these bonds understands what an equivalent exchange is, so I could not ask for something as large as her undying servitude or for her to take her own life, but I could ask for something fairly large whenever I decided to call in the favor. Learning that this was a possibility unlocked the first latch to the door down my new path. Beyond the concept of an overseer's bond being intriguing, I was fascinated by the idea that someone had asked me for the first time in centuries to contain a dangerous entity. Despite it having been much time since I'd done this at the Foundation, and my skills had slightly atrophied, I still considered it to be one of the things I was best at especially after learning that the reason I'd failed to contain creatures was because of Tarsa and her lackeys sabotaging my work. I also realized that Ludum was far from the only overseer that had problems with containing dangerous entities and beings that threatened her world. 
I thought back through my hundreds of years of study and found many memories of overseers struggling with beings, either too powerful to control or too vexing, that they wanted to wipe from the face of their world but could not manage to kill. I'd seen what could happen if a world had too many beings of immense power that threatened to leave and seek other worlds to ravage. Those overseers risked losing their lives, and more importantly, the lives of every being in their world. I was uniquely positioned with the skills and resources to help them with this problem, all while heading towards my own end goal. You see, this was when a sort of identity spawned for myself. I took this deal with Ludum, but told her I needed to promptly call in her favor. I saw the, admittedly, frustratingly incredible mechanics she'd employed as an overseer to forge her fighting arenas after allowing her universe to essentially burn in the same way mine had. Despite having learned much about being an overseer already to that point, I needed her to teach me how to build a more mechanical world in the ashes of my old one. She did as requested, though I would very much like to still create a new deal with her before enacting my plan. I appreciate her assistance all those years ago, but she needs to be handled as much as any other overseer I've encountered. Anyhow, after she spent some time teaching me all I needed to know, I do not have a full understanding of how my time progressed from there. As you may have noticed yourself by now, after living for hundreds of years, decades can feel like months, and the amount I needed to learn, then to refine, to build an entire world from scratch, was deeply immense. Once I got moving, however, with my universe locked off for the time being, and me forging a new world, I got into a state of flow, I suppose, crafting all the different pieces and layers of my somewhat revived planet. You see, instead of building a new world on the surface of my own, I built one within the core of what was once the Earth of my universe. The planet became essentially a colossal building, with thousands upon thousands of floors, with different rooms and different atmospheres, and methods of containing anything, no matter how powerful trapped within. Reaching a floor's edge could even send you walking right back through the opposite end, so the space seemed infinite. I made the most secure prison in the multiverse, that some have taken to calling the juvenile title of Baxell's Prison. I could contain anyone or anything within it that an overseer may need. It was even secure enough that no overseer could go in or out without my permission. With that accomplished, my plan could finally march proudly into Phase 2. I allowed Ludum, who was possibly the most famous overseer in the multiverse, to spread word to others, to her clients, that my world was a place where you could trap the worst of the worst beings that you could no longer stand having in your world. There was but one simple price, forging an overseer's bond with me, one that would simply involve them agreeing to a favor. A favor they've all now learned I'd not likely call in for quite some time if at all. That part of my reputation was important, as overseers are much more likely to agree to a vague arrangement when they know they may cease being overseers before it ever has to be paid. You see, an overseer bond leaves its mark on the energy of that universe and overseer, so if I make an agreement with one who chooses to pass on their position, the overseer that takes their place will still owe me a debt. To further forge a reputation that suits my goal, I have called in a small handful of these, making the tasks requested big enough to seem reasonable, but small enough to allow my reputation to spread as someone who does not ask for much of those who owe him. I have not entirely hidden who I am, however. I knew if I attempted this, one small slip could cause cracks to form in my persona that would cause people to question my trustworthiness. This is why I have not pretended to be particularly friendly or warm. Many overseers who have met me certainly do not like me, but I have ensured that my character has been firmly stated as a completely and utterly trustworthy being, and I only intend to betray that trust once. 
of the roughly 24,000 overseers still in existence, I have deals with nearly 16,000 of them. While it is far from all of them, I must admit, looking back, this does feel like a staggering accomplishment. If I may sound somewhat arrogant. Living for 6,000 years has been exhausting in many regards, but has the obvious benefit of giving me plenty of time to accomplish something that should be impossible, and I am not willing to risk it failing because of that wretched reaper. The second I enact my plan, while I can't say this for certain, I suppose, I strongly believe the reaper will sense it and step in to stop me. Overseers are likely inaccurately considered an essential part of the multiverse's fabric. I cannot allow another goal of mine to be snuffed out by the Reaper, not when I have come this far. So if you truly believe that you have a way to stop her and you can prove this to me, I will be forever in your debt. Overseer, Bond, or not, I would do anything necessary to see this plan through. So I must know, if you are truly willing to help me, how can you provide me with some genuine hope that you have a way to stop the Reaper? The multiverse will always have a Reaper. If one is killed, another immediately inherits the role. But like with becoming an overseer, the abilities take time to learn. So we just need to kill the Reaper and enact your plan while the new one is still weak. Well, that does indeed sound like a desirable plan. You make it sound as though killing the Reaper will be easy. When precisely was the last time the being in this role was even killed? Don't worry about that. Give me a couple more decades. I have a curse in the works that will make exactly what we need. I'm creating a Nightmare Hunter that will be able to kill the Reaper and anything else we need her to. I'm certain you understand this can't be one of your demons. I'm aware you revel in being referred to as Fear herself, but a being that thrives on Fear will have no power against the Reaper. And if your intention is to give this curse to a human, how can you be so sure they'll do as you desire? I promise I've thought this through, Dresden. She'll have no choice but to help. The decision will seem like it's kill the Reaper or let her world burn. And when her life path goes as I've planned, little Koshmara will definitely choose to go for the kill. This episode took a lot of writing. I wrote the first draft like over a month ago and have done a few different drafts of it since, and it's been planned for significantly longer than that. If you want more out of this episode, I am going to be doing an episode of the Design Notes podcast series this week on it, coming out Wednesday, where I'll be talking about how I came up with the story, things that I might have ended up cutting out, the characters I chose to draw and design. That'll be up on the Popgrass Studios Patreon, and that weekly podcast series is just one of the many benefits of being a member of the Popgrass Studios Patreon. Thank you to all the amazing people on it that are helping support the channel in a way that makes sure I can keep doing more fun original story episodes like this, and what we've got coming up on Friday, which isn't a direct sequel to this, but certainly has some of these elements in it. And if you are new to this channel and you want more stuff out of Dresden Oakland, I've finally made a whole playlist of his specific SCP episodes, and he does show up in the Escape from Baxell's Prison Saga, which I think is one of the best story arcs on Popgrass Studios still. But besides that, that's all for today, except of course for ending this video on some kind of positive or inspiring note, and the thought I want to leave people with today is a quote from a man who goes by Humble the Poet who says that being truly loved means to risk not being likable. To maintain good relationships, you have to have boundaries and sometimes say no. And if the people that you're putting your boundaries up with can't handle that, then maybe they're not the right people to have in your life long term. I hope that's inspiring to someone out there. I love you all and I'll see you all in the next episode on Friday. Mara's final kill. See you there. Goodbye.